Imagine a time before the discovery of complex numbers. In this scenario, your entire mathematical world is limited to real numbers. Most importantly for us, the concept of a square root of a negative number doesn't exist. And why would that bother me exactly? Were there some problems that mathematicians were dealing with that they just couldn't find a solution? Think about x squared plus 1 equals 0. Solve it with any real number. You see? There are no solutions within the real numbers. So, in order to deal with it, I introduce a new symbol, i, an imaginary unit. Exactly, with the property that i squared equals minus 1. By introducing i, you can solve the equation x squared plus 1 equals 0. This innovative step allows you to expand the number system to include complex numbers, which are combinations of real and imaginary numbers, like 2 plus 3i. But when you introduce i, you also accidentally and unintentionally have to introduce another number, negative i. That in itself also satisfies i squared equals minus 1. So how do we distinguish i from negative i using only real numbers? Both of them seem exactly the same. Great catch. And this difference leads to the concept of conjugates in mathematics. A conjugate is a pair of numbers that look very similar but have opposite signs for their imaginary parts. For example, if you have a complex number z equals a plus bi, its conjugate is a minus bi. They are a kind of symmetry in mathematics. For the numbers i and minus i, both are solutions to the equation x squared plus 1 equals 0. This means they are interchangeable in any polynomial with real coefficients. If one is a solution, so is the other. Fine, their lack of distinction is labeled as conjugates now. But where does this lead us to? How about we generalize it? For any polynomial equation, you can examine all the possible ways the roots can be swapped around without changing the equation itself. And these swaps are known as symmetries. Imagine you have a polynomial equation with roots r1, r2, r3, and so on. Let's take a cubic polynomial as an example. The roots of this polynomial are 1, 2, and 3. If 1, 2, and 3 are solutions, you can swap them in various ways. Keep them the same, 1, 2, 3. Swap 1 and 2. 2, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, and so on. The collection of all these possible swaps forms a structure called a symmetry group. So essentially what you're saying is that symmetry represents all the possible ways you can swap the roots without changing the polynomial equation. Could you show me how that's done with complex numbers? Take the very same polynomial equation x squared plus 1 equals 0. The roots of this equation are i and minus i. The idea is that you can swap i and minus i, and the equation still holds true. Now, a more complex example is x to the power of 3 minus 1 equals 0. The roots are 1, omega, and omega squared, where omega and omega squared are complex roots, roots of unity. The possible swaps are all of these, 1, omega, omega squared, no swap, 1, omega squared, omega, and so on. These permutations form the symmetry group for this polynomial, specifically the symmetric group S3, which has six elements. And these swaps are what is called a symmetry group. And this is the first main idea of Galois theory. Every polynomial has a symmetry group. Let me understand something. So far, all of it has been concerning polynomial equations. What if I want to solve for x to the power of n equals 1, not equals 0? Well, if we take a simple example like x squared equals 1, what are the solutions for real numbers? x equals 1 and x equals negative 1, two solutions. If we go higher, x to the power of 3 equals 1, there should be three solutions because it's a cubic equation. One solution is real, x equals 1. But the other two solutions are complex numbers. Yes, two of the three solutions to the equation are imaginary. The equation can be rewritten as x to the power of 3 minus 1 equals 0. So we kind of have to make it into a polynomial equation. Factoring this, we get this. And this gives us the following solutions. To find the solutions to the quadratic equation, we use the quadratic formula. For this equation, we have a equals 1, b equals 1, and c equals 1. Plugging these values into the quadratic formula, we get the following. So the two solutions to the quadratic equation are these. And these two solutions are complex or imaginary numbers. Therefore, the three solutions to the original equation x to the power of 3 equals 1 are these. 
Now, where do you think the solutions to the equation might lie on the complex plane? I'm not very familiar with it. No problem. The complex plane is like the regular number line, but with an extra dimension for the imaginary part. The horizontal axis represents the real part of a complex number, and the vertical axis represents the imaginary part. Now, back to our equation x to the power of 3 equals 1, besides the real solution x equals 1, the other two solutions are complex numbers that can be represented on the complex plane. And why do they lie on the unit circle? Because when raised to the power of 3, they equal 1, and they are evenly spaced around the circle. This spacing shows a type of symmetry, and these solutions are called the roots of unity. Specifically, for x to the power of 3 equals 1, the solutions are 1, omega, and omega squared, where omega is a complex number representing a 120 degree rotation on the unit circle. Now, we've seen this with roots of unity, but do you think this idea can be applied to other polynomial equations as well? I suppose it could. Any polynomial would have roots, and those roots could have their own symmetries. That's right. With x to the power of 3 minus 1 equals 0, we found the roots 1, omega, and omega squared. What kind of symmetries did we find with these roots? that rotating the roots around the unit circle by 120 degrees mapped each root to another, forming a symmetry group. Now, let's think about this. What if I told you that these symmetries can tell us something even more important about polynomials? Like whether a polynomial can be solved just using basic arithmetic operations and taking roots, which we call solving by radicals. That sounds interesting. How can symmetries tell us that? Remember how the roots of x to the power of 3 equals 1 formed a group that showed their symmetries. This group is an example of a Galois group. The second main idea of Galois theory is that the structure of this group can determine whether we can solve the polynomial by radicals. So the Galois group of a polynomial can tell us whether we can solve it by using radicals? How does that work? Imagine we have a polynomial and we want to know if its roots can be found using only basic operations and roots. The Galois group of this polynomial holds the key. If this group is solvable, then the polynomial can indeed be solved by radicals. What's a solvable group? If you guys are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. A solvable group is one that can be broken down into simpler and easy to understand groups. To say a group G is solvable means we can find a series of smaller groups within it, where each group fits neatly into the one before it. And the steps between groups are simple in a certain way. Specifically, the steps between groups must be abelian, meaning their elements behave like regular addition. Order doesn't matter. Let's consider the Klein 4 group, V4, which has elements E, A, B, and AB, where E is the identity element. A times A is E, B times B is E, and AB is the same as BA. The Klein 4 group is solvable because it has a simple structure where each subgroup is straightforward. And the steps between these groups are abelian, meaning they can act like regular addition where order doesn't matter. So, because the Klein 4 group is solvable, the polynomial can be solved by radicals. Exactly. Now, let's see why the symmetry group S5 is not solvable. The symmetric group S5, which is a Galois group of the general quintic polynomial, is a group of all possible ways to arrange five elements. This group is not solvable because the steps between its subgroups are more complicated and don't behave like simple addition. And one of its important subgroups, called A5, cannot be broken down further in a simple way. This means that the general quintic equation can't be solved by radicals, because its Galois group S5 is too complex. So if the Galois group is not solvable, then the polynomial can't be solved by using radicals. This is why the general quintic equation, for example, cannot be solved by radicals. Its Galois group, the symmetric group S5, is not solvable. This was a major breakthrough because it showed the limitations of solving equations using radicals. I just want to mention that this video was inspired by Tom Linster's work from the University of Edinburgh. I'll link his course notes in the description below if you're interested in knowing more. And this was an overview of Galois theory. If you're curious to know more, check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it.